Biblical faith is not a leap in the dark. It's a deliberate step into the light of God's truth. It's not believing something that's false. It's believing something that's true. Dr. Keener, it's really a joy to welcome you to the podcast. I've long awaited this conversation, and uh, I'm so thankful for you. Thanks for being here. Th thank you for inviting me. It's a privilege to be with you. Well, this is... Uh, as as the folks here at the podcast know, we are in the middle. Uh, we've just started a brand new year, 2024, and I always like to start a new year um, in a spiritual formation series in an effort really to point the, the, the direction of our heart, to calibrate the direction of our heart due north uh, toward the Lord. And uh, so today's going to be a deep dive about, about Scripture, and uh, I'm excited to just glean from you. So I want to start here. Really, just by asking you, Dr. Keener, just to share your heart on why formation and Christian maturity are so vital for life and really the posture we need to embody as disciples of Jesus, whose lives are aimed at effective formation. I'd love to learn from you. Sure. We are, I mean, God created this for a purpose. And if we, I mean, 100 million years from now, it's not going to matter how much how much money we made or what honors people give to us. What matters a hundred million years from now is our relationship with the Lord and the difference that we are able to make in light of eternity in this world for Him. And that comes by Christ in us, Christ being formed in us, uh, Paul talks about that in Galatians 4, uh, talks about transformation into his image, transformation by the renewing of our minds, Romans 12, 2. So formation is is fundamental to what will last forever. I'd love to drill down on that. Uh, Romans 12 is one of my favorite passages. In your experience in studying and distilling the scriptures and parsing them apart, I'd love for you to just explain what that means from a practical standpoint, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Can you break that down for us? Sure. And you do, you do have some traditions, Christian traditions, that really emphasize the mind and some Christian traditions that really emphasize what we call the heart, although in, in biblical language the heart includes the mind. But we need, I mean, we need both. It's not like, it's got to be one or the other. Why, why, why is there a competition? Um, Romans 12 talks about the renewing of our mind. And this, this newness in light of where Paul talks about newness elsewhere in Romans, it's a contrast with the old. It's what we were in the old sinful humanity, our, our identification with uh, the history of sinful humanity. But in Christ... The, the coming of the Messiah was to bring about a new era, and um, Jewish expectation was in this in this new world there'd be no more sin, there'd be no more death, there'd be no more um, war and injustice and so on. Well, in Christ, I mean, He's come, He's yet to come, but we already have the first fruits of that. So in Christ, we have the first fruits of that new creation. And the renewing of our mind is helping our thinking to catch up with what God has done for us in Christ in inaugurating us into that that new life. In in the context, the the preceding context, which is why he says therefore in Romans twelve one, he talks about God's thoughts and God's plans and how God has been working them out in history so so as to make his his salvation available to everyone who calls on him. And and we, we can learn about his plan in history, especially from Scripture. So immersing ourselves in Scripture is one way of doing that, seeing our, our place in the history of God's plans. Another is in the following context. So he talks about, don't be conformed to this age, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he says, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think soberly so as to have sound judgment, recognizing our, our place in the body of Christ. So formation is not just individual, but it's a matter of 
recognizing our place in God's people in history, but also recognizing our place in relationship to other members of the body of Christ. God gives each of us different gifts. And so, you know, one person is better at doing podcasts. <laughs> Another person is is better at writing footnotes. Let, that would be me. Uh, another person is better at, at the gift of prophecy or the gift of teaching or, or whatever. You know, we each have different gifts, but we bring them all for the purpose of serving the body of Christ. We don't look down on one another, but we respect one another's gifts, or we're supposed to. And um, in that way, we yield our bodies for Christ's service, Romans 12, 1, for the service of Christ's body, Romans 12, 4 and following. That, that we see each of us as, as members in that larger body. So the renewing of the mind puts us in a larger context, the context of God's work in history that we see in Scripture and the context of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Wow. This is really interesting that we've already navigated our conversation this way. Do we need do we need perhaps then a collective broader perspective about the purpose of formation in and of itself um, recognizing that we are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to be agents used for the transformation of other people's lives is that sort of what I hear you saying that formation we can't get narrow-minded about formation and make it individualistic but instead recognize our place in being formed transformed fits like a puzzle piece into the broader is that what i hear you saying yeah i mean in the book of acts we we read a lot about the empowerment by the spirit and and sometimes you know in our you know when people talk about spirituality in our context it's like american culture is what i can get for me <laughs> you yes. know it's it's more self-centered but but empowerment in the book of acts is empowerment for mission for what God has called us to do for the world. And so, yes, we need that empowerment. Yes, we need to uh, soak in God's presence. We need to pray. We need to, we need to immerse ourselves in God's Word. But that very practice will not make us so heavenly minded we're no earthly good, but rather it'll make us so heavenly minded that we are some earthly good because we'll be sowing the fruit of, of what heaven does in us into the world around us to make a difference. Wow. And, and it is true in different cultures, there are different emphases too. I mean, my wife is from Congo Brazzaville and she taught me to pay attention to how God speaks to us in dreams. Obviously not all dreams. Some of them are due to your pizza or something. Sure. <laughs> but, <Sure>. uh, <laughs> but um, you know, in different places, there's different emphases and we can learn from one another mm. as well as serve one another in the body of Christ. Now, what an interesting case study that is. And I'll ask one more question um, along this line then. Is there perhaps an uptick of maturity that we all can lean toward regarding honoring different streams within the body of Christ Certainly. without uh, becoming critical of them? For instance, you know, you and I chatted uh, offline before we got started. I grew up with Pentecostal charismatic roots, very much still a part of my, of my relationship with the Lord, et cetera, et cetera. However, when I look at like my Baptist brothers and sisters, I see such great appreciation for the scriptures. Yes. And it, is that perspective, do you think something we all can uh, grow in? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's ideal to take the best of each. Avoid the mm. worst of each, but take, yeah, sure. take sure, the sure. best of, of each. You know, the, um, those who love Scripture and immerse themselves in Scripture, those who love evangelism, those who love justice, those who love, um, those who love prayer and worship. Why, what's the problem with any of those? <laughs> we, we need all those, and so we can learn from, from one another as, as fellow members of Christ's body. That doesn't mean that there aren't things that we disagree with, in other people's traditions or our own tradition. I mean, everything has to stand under Scripture and evaluation by Scripture and the discernment of the Spirit. But that's uh, 
that that doesn't mean we don't learn from one another. Mm. What does maturity require then? What does that require of us in order to mature to get to that place? Recognizing that we have one Lord, that's Christ, and we're all together under him and we're all supposed to be seeking him. So it's not like I judge you by my tradition or I judge you by my perspective, or I judge you by my political party, or I just, I'm getting myself in trouble now, or I judge you by my, my computer brand, or my <laughs> which yeah, way you roll yeah, the yeah. toilet paper, you know, all the, all the things we divide <laughs> over. Uh, yeah. But I am your brother. I'm here to lay down my life for you, to serve you, and and I want to learn from you too. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, a cornerstone of effective formation requires a committed relationship to the scriptures. I think we can all, can all agree upon that. Um, broad question, and we can drill down on this. Approaching the text requires what from the perspective of heart posture? And then we can get into the technical side of things. How do we approach the text well, Dr. Keener? Again, from the standpoint that Jesus is Lord, that God is real, and so um, I'm a professor, so I do academic study of Scripture, obviously. But you can study Scripture academically and still not believe it. You can study Scripture academically and still not live it. And as Christians have pointed out through history, whether the monastic traditions or the Orthodox the overlap, Orthodox tradition, Luther, Calvin, uh, Wesley, everybody um, has emphasized that we need to embrace Scripture and faith. So, I mean, we may debate about the contours of exactly what that looks like, but that's all right, because um, <clears throat> I guess there's some latitude there <laughs> as we're learning, but, but we need to, it's like, if Scripture says, don't commit adultery, I don't just study that for academic purposes. I say, okay, God, I'm not allowed to, to do this. Protect my heart from, from going in this direction. And, and I pray into it. I live into it. Um, or, you know, you shall not commit murder. I mean, and Jesus, Jesus does this with Scripture. He says, okay, you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. I say to you, you shall not want to commit adultery. You've heard it said, you shall not kill. I say to you, you shall not want to kill. So he, he addresses lust, he addresses anger. If we really embrace the Scripture with all our heart, and we really love God's Word, it's a matter of embracing the message and saying, oh, this is right, this is what God wants from us, and we want to please God. And that's something where we need the Spirit of God. Um, we, 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 it's not like just a matter of self-discipline. Okay, I don't want to do this. I don't. Want, yeah, actually, I, I really would like to belt the guy in the nose, but uh, I don't want to. But, but God, God is the one who transforms us, and we can call on Him to, to change our hearts. And so we read Scripture prayerfully. I mean, Psalm 119, over and over, not, not every verse, but over and over, uh, God, please... Turn my heart to love your word, to obey your word. Yes. It's really helpful. I, I, I do want to ask you to maybe give us a primer on how to approach the text. So whether it's narrative or poetry or whether it's the mm -hmm. wisdom books or whatever, you know, to look at the content itself, the context, the concern of the writer, etc. I'd love to hear about that from you, but I want to sort of poke on this really fast because you took us mm -hmm. there. Because I think about... I don't know, pick any social issue of the day. A lot of times we say, I'm wrestling with that. Mm -hmm. Is our wrestle, Dr. Keener, an attempt to do surgery on the scriptures and fit the scriptures into a current cultural context, into our worldview? Or are we allowing the scriptures to read us, to tangle up with us and to change us? You know, I think... I think it's easy to slide to uh, the former, but I hear the call to say, I look at the text, I recognize, Lord, your truth is eternal, so therefore I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my true and submit with humility to your truth that I'd be changed from the inside out. What's your take on that? I, I hear that a lot in conversation. Well, I'm wrestling with that. And, and part of me, again, like I said, wonders, 
are we trying to do surgery on the text to make it, make it fit us? Or are we trying to have a humble heart whereby we adjust to it? What are your thoughts? Yes. Hmm. <laughs> People do both. But yes, what we want to be doing is submitting to Scripture. And sometimes we have to wrestle because it's like... Okay, this was written for this historical context. What does that mean in our historical context? And are we going from the scriptures to today, or are we bringing today's questions to the scriptures? Both are legitimate, but if you're doing the latter, we need to make sure that we're being faithful to what the scriptures are actually saying, because the fit isn't exact, you know, from one culture to another culture. When, when my wife and I got married, I would say, Shetem, I love you. And I was expecting she would say, Shetem wa aussi, I love you too. She speaks French. So I was expecting she would she would say, I love you too. But she would say, thank you. And I was like, oh, my wife doesn't love me. <laughs> but it was just a different cultural expectation of how you respond to a statement like that. And it took us a long time to figure that out. So from one culture to another, Words, gestures, all that can mean something different. But when we're dealing with scripture, we're dealing with cultures that were like a couple thousand years ago, at least. Uh, with the Old Testament, some of it, you know, like 4,000 years ago, whatever. So we are, um, to, to engage that, Certainly there are principles we can learn, and, and that's what we want to do. We want to learn the lessons from the text and and really see how they apply in our settings today. But it really helps us to get some handle on what it would have meant in that culture. So when we draw the analogies to our culture, we draw the right analogies rather than the wrong ones. So women wearing head coverings, holy kisses, some of those are fairly obvious to us in our culture, but there are other things that we just assume should be understood a certain way. And it would, I'm not saying that you can't understand the Bible without the background. I'm just saying it helps you understand it better. I love yeah. that. Okay, let's go right there then. If, if mm -hmm. you were sitting down with any one of our listeners today mm -hmm. and they were sitting in... I don't know, one of your classes, be it a hermeneutics class or whatever, and, and you wanted to teach us, all of us, how to better approach the scriptures so that we can assimilate the truth, the eternal truth. So I think about what Paul wrote in Second Timothy 3, that all scripture is God-breathed. Yes. You know, um, it's eternal, it's powerful, it's potent. Yes. In thinking about things like context, the concern of the writer, the content itself. Dr. Keener, would you give us a primer on how to approach Scripture okay. well? Sure. The Bible is an inspired text. So there's two, two points in that. First of all, it's inspired. We, we, we read it to hear God's voice there. When I, when I read a book by somebody that I know, when I'm reading the book, I kind of hear it in their, in their voice. So... If it was by Gordon Fee, you know, I hear when he's 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 rising to a crescendo, he's preaching this text, uh, and if if it's by you know N.T. Wright, you know, I I hear it with okay, I know I know what N.T. Wright means by this, if you know, or, or by by whomever, but in the case of uh, it being an inspired text, it's inspired, it's also text, <laughs> so. It's, it's assumed we should take that into account when we read it. If Paul writes a letter to the Corinthians, well, the Corinthians knew what their issues were that he's addressing. And Paul, I'm sure, welcomes us listening in, but we should take into account what's being addressed in Corinth. And also, uh, the, the background, when I, when I started uh, looking for background, that changed the way I read maybe 20, 30 percent of the passages uh, to, to a significant enough degree that, oh, it didn't mean what I thought it meant. But, but when I started reading in context, that changed about 90 percent. Wow. Because the, the immediate literary context, what's already there in the text itself, makes a huge difference. 
in how we understand it. God didn't give us the Bible one verse at a time. He, he, for the most part, I mean, Proverbs, you know, is a collection of sayings, so that's a bit different. But for the most part, God gave us one book of the Bible at a time. So when we read, we read it in context. When the early church heard, say, the, the Gospel of Mark read to them, or Paul's letter to the Romans read to them, they'd hear the whole work read to them in one sitting in, in the church. So if we're going to, like, um, think about one verse, we need to think about how that verse relates to the immediate context and to the context of the whole book, because it was meant to be understood in, in light of the whole book in which it appears. So just to take a common example. I'd love that. That'd be so helpful. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Over and over again, I hear that being applied to the devil. Now, it's true. The devil does come to steal and kill and destroy. <laughs> no, no argument there. But that's not what that verse is talking about. If you read the verse in context, it's talking, you know, the, the thieves are the ones who climb in. They don't enter by the door. They come some other way. Those who came before Jesus claiming his role are all thieves and robbers. Uh, they're also compared to wolves. Those who come to exploit the sheep for their own interests, who aren't really the shepherd or serving the shepherd. And in the, in the context right before that, he's talking to, to some Pharisees who kicked a man out of the synagogue whom Jesus had healed. And so Jesus is applying this directly to them as, as those who lead someone astray or, or try to lead someone astray from from following him so it has much i mean the devil does try to do that right but this is the application today would be for people who are exploiting god's people for their own interests you know whether it's sexual or monetary or whatever wow uh, rather than there to serve the sheep and look out for the sheep's welfare this is so good okay I have to ask, is there another perhaps familiar passage that we could deconstruct in that way to say, you know what, we've, we've perhaps approached this um, erroneously and thus came to conclusions that weren't intended? Um, I think it's pretty brilliant that you took us right to John 10.10. 10. Well, like I said, there's like 90%. <laughs> so, sometimes we inherited good good verses yeah. uh, for the right purposes from, from people who read scripture in context. And, and maybe you, maybe you go to a church where the text is normally interpreted in context. And, but when I, when I pull my students, what are your favorite verses? So many of them are used out of context, but another one, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And, and I'm deliberately taking ones where it doesn't really affect it theologically. I mean, Paul does say, rejoice in the Lord always. So, yeah, we can always say to rejoice in the Lord. But but the particular verse, this is the day the Lord has made, the context is this in, in Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected, the Lord made it the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's celebrating a particular occasion when the rejected cornerstone became the head of the corner. And in the psalm, that may be referring to uh, David being exalted after being chased by Saul. But uh, it, its application in the New Testament certainly is when, when Jesus was exalted after being rejected by his, his enemies, uh, exalted to God's right hand. It's actually applied in the same chapter in, in, in Mark 12. Uh, Mark Mark twelve ten and then Mark twelve thirty six, um, and then is is used elsewhere in the New Testament as well. But it's applied uh, the the stone that the builders rejected is applied to Jesus, and so when we're what we're celebrating, especially in that text, is the exaltation of Jesus, or I guess in a more general way, uh, general application of the principle just when God turns things around and, and vindicates his servants. Um, 
So, you know, when we sing, sing it for it applying to every day, it's really not the point of the original text. It's not theologically wrong because we can celebrate the Lord every day. Mm-hmm, certainly. It, it, it just shows how often we don't or lift Jesus higher. <laughs> we have songs about that. Yeah, yeah. And the, the immediate context of that is it's, it says in the next verse of John 12, Jesus said this concerning the death that he was about to die. So when you're singing that, what you're singing is crucify him, crucify him. No, <laughs> we know that's not what the song means. But the verse <laughs> that on which the song is based normally is actually about the crucifixion. So I just I start students with that just to illustrate we all say we believe in context, but how often we, we quote verses we've heard out of context. And so if we study the Bible in a more disciplined way, just working through text after text, uh, passage by passage, book by book, we will what we'll hear it more in its context. The, the Holy Spirit, pe- people, it's good to have faith in Scripture. That's what we were just talking about, you know, trusting the Scripture. But faith is only as good as its object. And so if you are trusting God, well, no, if you're trusting God, that's good. But if you're trusting a Scripture out of context, the basis of your trust there is is fallacious. Um, now, of course, if your trust is in God, even if the scripture's out of context, your trust is well placed in God. But you know, it's like if somebody's saying, "Well, the Bible says this, and therefore this will happen." Like the Book of Proverbs, you have principles there. They're not they're not meant to apply to every situation. That's why you can have uh, two proverbs side by side in the Book of Proverbs. Answer a fool according to their folly. And then right beside that, don't answer a fool according to their folly. <laughs> and both give principles, but they're for different situations. And so it's it's important to, to take the text the way God gave it to us in the context, in the, the genre or literary type, and, and so on, as it, best as possible. So where do we begin to do that? Let's say someone's listening right now saying, Dr. Keener, all my balloons have just been popped. And I'm excited about this because, again, I want people to engage with the scriptures well. You said this, faith is only as good as its object. Um, that's a profound statement in and of itself. So keeping that in mind, how do we become more disciplined? Are there specific study techniques or approaches that you would recommend for a more effective and transformative study of the scriptures. So uh, we open the Bible to, I don't know, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2. Pick any passage. What do we do first to set our minds and hearts aright so that we're reading well, studying well, applying well, learning well, positioning ourselves to be transformed effectively? What do you say? For For most of the church today, I think the first step is actually reading the Bible, because <laughs> I'm afraid a lot of a lot of people don't read it that much. Um, there, there are some parts of the Bible you can just get you can ingest them orally. You know, you can you can listen to Scripture. The narratives in the Bible, I think, you know, what, whatever will hold your interest orally is is fine. But but in terms of reading Scripture. Sometimes, like Ephesians, is is it's very dense. It's it's got a lot of detailed argumentation, uh, or not, not just argumentation, but um, Ephesians one. You need to read. Actually, you you need to pray <laughs> through it because it's just so full of of uh, insight. Some things get repeated multiple times, but that means Paul wants to emphasize them. So, you know, you you give all the more attention to those. Ultimately, we read it in light of what we know of the whole of Scripture. So there's like a, what some people call a hermeneutical psych circle. Um, we, we, I mean, the ideal is to, uh, 
work your way through every passage in its context, and then come up with your theology based on that. But we we all start with some some theology. It's really easier that way. And then we can adjust it as we're working through the the individual details. So with, say, Ephesians 1, don't just read a verse by itself, but follow through the context. So Ephesians 1 talks about predestination to get into a, a debated issue, because um, different people mean different things by, by that language. But the, the way Paul is using it in context, I'm not going to get into the theological debate, but just, just to see what Ephesians 1 says, it's celebrating God's love for us. It's not, it's not a dry doctrine. It's like the, God cared about you before the foundation of the world. He wanted you. He, he wanted his people to belong to him, to lavish his love on them. And so, yeah, I'm just taking that example because you listed Ephesians 1, but um, the first... Uh, th three b verses three and following it's so rich so yeah first is is the literary context second is the the broader context the setting in which something was written it, as best as we can reconstruct it some people really go into massive detail and it can get speculative we don't need all the speculations but there's some things we can actually know about ancient cultures. And in some of the things, a lot of the background that we need is actually in the Bible itself. So a lot of background for the New Testament is in the Old Testament. And uh, a lot of what we can know about ancient Israel's culture is in other passages in the Old Testament. So being a good Bible reader itself can help you, but then there are also resources when you need them. Um, that's why I did the Bible background commentary, was to put that at people's fingertips, make the, make the background available, because it makes no sense for me to teach Bible interpretation and say you need background, and then people don't know where to, where to get it. For sure. Yeah, folks, and I, I just want to take an aside and say I'm going to put links to uh, many of Dr. Keener's resources in the show notes over at wintoday.tv. I have many of them. I've used many of them. They're fabulous. So, again, I'll, I'll throw those in the, in the show notes for you. But um, So, Dr. Keener, I guess the follow-up question is then, um, if I were to ask you, Dr. Keener, when it comes to studying the Scriptures, we cannot do so effectively without blank. What fits in blank? What 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 finishes that statement in your mind? I guess the first, well, the first rule, if we're going to make a rule, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. So we, we humble ourselves before the message of Scripture. We let it challenge us. We let it challenge our theology. We let it challenge our life. Let it challenge our heart. And I think that's usually where the Holy Spirit will nail us, <laughs> our heart and our life. Um, and the second, I would say, context. Read it the way God gave it to us. So don't be satisfied with just a verse a day. And I don't want to discourage somebody who, who's on the run all the time and they say, if I can't just do a verse, I'm not going to do it at all. Please, that's not, I'm, I'm not saying don't do it at all. But, you know, if, if it's going to be a verse, try to get the context of that verse. Um, and so many, sometimes preaching even can be religious speeches decorated with the Bible memory verses. I mean, we come up with what we want to say, and then we decorate them with verses that we know. On, on, you know, and we preach the same topic over and over. Um, it's so much more rich to just work from the biblical text. And, and even, you know, in terms of illustrations that are, when somebody hears, when the original audience would hear Matthew 28, the Great Commission, they would think of it in light of the whole of Matthew's gospel. 
that they'd already heard read. So, you know, if they were thinking of make disciples of the nations, what's that about? Right from the start of Matthew's gospel, you got four women with Gentile associations in Jesus' genealogy. You've got the Magi. You've got um, God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones in chapter 3. Chapter 4, he settles in Galilee of the Gentiles. Uh, chapter 8, you've got a, a Gentile centurion. You, you've got um, some demoniacs in what seems to be Gentile territory. They're raising pigs there. Uh, and the Catholics, you've got, and you can keep going. I mean, it's a, if you make an outline just of the passage in Matthew 28, you can fill it in based on what Matthew has already said. So that when people hear Matthew 28, you're preaching it, they're hearing it the way the first audience would have heard it in light of the rest of Matthew's gospel. And, and, then, and then the background, I usually would say, is the third step. But it also makes a difference. Uh, I mean, you want to see how, if you're really going into detail, how a phrase or a word is used elsewhere by the same author. Um, you can look at how it's used in the, well, this is like, if you're really going into detail and you're using Greek and Hebrew, you can see how the Greek term in the New Testament was used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament and, and so on. I mean, most people aren't going to be going into that much detail. But also the the genre, the literary type of a work. So narrative, you know, when we tell stories to our kids, sometimes we'll say, what's the moral of the story? What's the lesson from this story? And that's, you know, that's how people told stories in antiquity, too. Uh, whether true stories or parables, whatever, what's the moral of the story? What's it, what's it meant to get across to us? You have laws. Laws, like, like the laws in Exodus and, and, and Deuteronomy and so on, when we read laws, they, they, they teach us ethics, but only in a limited way. So, for example, you know, the law says you're supposed to stop when you see a stop sign. But the law doesn't make you necessarily want to stop when you see a stop sign. So, in the same way, the laws of Moses, they raise the standards ethically, but they they don't always give us the ideal. So Jesus says, yeah, Moses said that to you because of the hardness of your heart. But from the beginning, God's ideal was higher than this. And so we, we take that into account, but we can still learn some ethical principles from the law, especially as we see it in light of, you know, what it's addressing in agrarian culture and, the, and, and so on. Um, letters we take into account. This is say, Paul or another writer, dealing with a concrete situation. So these are case studies. If God spoke to them in this situation, what would God say in our situation? And often he draws on universal principles in doing that. And sometimes he does so, well, always I think he draws on universal principles. Sometimes he states them explicitly. But again, we have to dig into the text to to see that, and especially insofar as possible in light of the situation that he's addressing or the culture that he's addressing. Like when he says, go to Troas, get my cloak and bring it to me. I don't know if you've ever tried to obey that command. But, <laughs> but no, we know, we understand, okay, that was to Timothy. But but we, we see something about the relationship between Paul and Timothy, that he could trust Timothy, that Timothy would want to do this because of the closeness of their mentoring relationship. I mean, there are things that we can learn that are modeled for us in the text. So all of Scripture is for all time, but not not every text is for all circumstances. So that's what we need to take into account. And the more we immerse ourselves in Scripture and get a picture of the whole of Scripture and God's heart and His His continuing message that, that keeps drumming home through all of Scripture, the more we're going to... Uh, and, and the, the, his plan in history, I mean, the good news, 1 Corinthians 15 summarizes that in terms of Jesus' death and resurrection, but 
he says, according to the scriptures. So there's a backstory to it. The Old Testament of, of God's saving works climaxes in this. And when Mark opens by saying, the good news of, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, um, or he says the beginning, you know, of the good news. So it's going to climax in Jesus' death and resurrection, but it's also, here are the events that, that led to Jesus' death and and prefigured his resurrection. And so, um, yeah, all of all of Scripture has this kind of uh, movement towards towards the cross and Jesus' resurrection, and afterwards, looking back to that, you know, what we build on and um, what we seek to exemplify in Christ. I, I hope I'm not just wandering all over the place with this. No, 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 no. You're giving us a treasure trove of goodness here. I, I do want to recap what I heard you say, Dr. Keenan. Yes. Please fill Thank in the you. blank for folks. Um, if we want to study and approach the scriptures well, the first thing I heard you say, Dr. Keener, is that Number one, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Number two, yes. context. Read it the way God gave it to us. Number three, yes. background. Number four, literary type genre. I'd love to double click on the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. Give us a primer on what is the fear of the Lord? We read that in Proverbs. Um, mm. We hear that a lot, but Dr. Keener, mm. what is, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, how do we engage ourselves with and position our hearts toward the fear of the Lord. What does that look like? When we get a picture of it throughout the Old Testament, it seems like talking about the fear of the Lord, respect isn't quite a strong enough word, but it's not like fear like, you know, you're having an anxiety attack or a panic mm -hmm. attack. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's fear in the sense of reverence and awe for God. We were experiencing this with the outpouring at Asbury um, <clears throat> early, earlier in the year where the presence of God was just so palpable there. I mean, you, 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 I guess there's certain things you wouldn't do in front of certain people that you respect. Well, in God's presence, you couldn't boast. You couldn't pretend to be something that you're not. You just were in awe of God and worshiping God and humbling yourself before God, welcoming whatever he wants to do to change you. That's, that's what we were experiencing. The fear of the Lord, I think, is also related to, to faith. Sometimes we have the wrong idea of faith. Uh, I was talking about it's only as good as its object. Sometimes we think of faith in terms of rationalizing away all, all doubt, uh, almost like um, fairy tale uh, belief, uh, wishing really hard. Or sometimes I think people think of faith as, um, yeah, make-believe. But, and some of this goes back to the, uh, some earlier philosophers who talked about they use the language of faith being subjective versus knowledge being objective, and then saying that we need to take a leap in the dark. That's what faith is. But actually, biblical faith is not a leap in the dark. It's a deliberate step into the light of God's truth. Wow. It's not believing something that's false. It's believing something that's true. And so, you know, we don't start with perfect faith. But in the Bible, we see how God develops that faith in people and raises the expectations accordingly as, as that faith develops. But it's part of the problem of, you know, the way we translate faith, like we think, oh, we've got to have this amount of faith, like we have to work it up. It's not how much your faith is. Jesus says a mustard seed is enough. It's, the, it's not how big is your faith, it's how big is the God in whom is our faith. He's worthy of our trust. And so uh, I think a better, a better English translation would be trust, because in English, believe and faith, you know, the verb and the noun are, are separate, but th that's not the way they are in Greek or, or Hebrew. It's more like um, we trust the one who's trustworthy. We have faith in the one who's faithful. We rely on the one who's reliable. Mm 
It's about God's reliability. It's not about something we work up in ourselves. And the fear of the Lord means God is God. <laughs> but because he's God, if he says something, we can, we can depend on that. We can depend on the one who's dependable. That's faith and that's the fear of the Lord. What you said was worth the price of admission today alone. Wow, that's so good. I, I think about in Hebrews, one of my favorite translations is the Amplified Classic Edition. And um, in Hebrews, it describes faith as the leaning of our entire human personalities upon God in absolute confidence and trust mm. in his power, his wisdom, and his goodness. And I love that, yeah. that amplification of that word faith. Yeah, confidence confidence also i think and yeah and hope what we translate hope in english sometimes we think well i hope it's true <laughs> but oh, biblical Dr. hope Keener. yeah is maybe better translated expectation because it's something we're waiting for we we know it's there we're just waiting for it and so uh and then if you have a translation that says loving kindness what in the world is loving kindness well it Whatever else it includes, certainly it has to do with love. You know, so sometimes our translations obscure things. They make it harder for us to understand. Um, the, the Hebrew word chesed, it's like faithful love, um, unending love, persistent love, uh, covenant love. It's, but, um, but yeah, some translations are better than others on certain things. And I had a colleague once, when people would ask him, what's the best translation? He would answer, for which verse? <laughs> well, also, let's go right, verse? yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let's go right there then, because, and I, I, I want to be cognizant of the time, because I know you have uh, another meeting, um, so I want to respect your time, of course. But I'd love to go right there as we begin the descent uh, of this conversation. Talk to us about Bible translations. What's your advice on the various translations available today? Do you favor one over another? For what purpose? Like formal versus dynamic? I'd just love to learn from you. Like I, I love to write and teach from ESV. I study mm -hmm. with Amplified. I love the NIV. But, but talk to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, different, different translations have different objectives. I think when you're reading narrative where more of the point centers on the development of of the storyline and by story i'm not saying somebody took me like story meaning it has to be fictitious i don't mean it that way i mean it's narrative uh, so true story but uh although they're also fictitious ones i think most of the parables are fictitious but anyway um well actually a lot of them could be true to life but then some of them like the guy for the king where the 10,000 talents were owed. Nobody could owe that much money <laughs> back then. That was more than the amount of money in circulation in any kingdom back then, uh, except maybe the Roman Empire or the Parthian Empire. But anyway, um, but for, for the narratives, I think usually the more dynamic is, is, is good. Um, NIV is good. Some, some get, I think, like too free, but then if you're doing a detailed argument where it really matters, where a lot can sometimes hinge on a particular word, there I want the those that are closer to word for word. There's no way to get exactly word for word from one language to another. So nothing is completely word for word. But some things help more than others. Now the Amplified, the, the translation you gave from the Amplified, I like that. But... A word doesn't mean everything it can possibly mean. It means what it can mean in context. So sometimes the Amplified goes too far. And some of the paraphrases, I guess as long as you know it's a paraphrase, it's an interpretation, it's all right. Just so long as you keep in mind that's what it is. But for translations, you know, you can maybe have for study, uh, not necessarily, it'd be pretty hard to listen to it on tape this way, but for study, you can maybe have a fairly dynamic equivalent on one side and a more closer to word for word, say NIV on one side, NASB on the other. Um, now, the ESV, I actually use the ESV a lot because of the word for word, but 
the translators of the ESV actually are all from a certain theological perspective, and that doesn't affect most passages, but it those of us who hold certain views um, on certain passages, we, <laughs> we say, okay, you better look at a different translation too, because there's a little bit of... Uh, anyway. Can but, you share an example of, of, of <laughs> one of those verses? I, you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you're comfortable, I'd love to... Sure. I, I'm learning right now, too, because like I said, I, um, my... My book, I pr I use the ESV primarily um, as my text, I like, I like as my translation um, in my book. Um, used a bunch of translations, but that was my primary. I like to teach from ESV, but now I'm I'm like Dr. Keener, teach me. I want to uh, I want to learn. Uh, on, on on gender issues, uh, all the I think all the ESV translators held a certain view on gender, whereas the NIV translators. By contrast, it's like half and half. So NIV translators reflect a wider range of evangelical approaches. Uh, so, and that's why it's often good to use more than one translation. You use you use one to keep the other one honest. Uh, and it happens with every translation. I mean, I did study notes. Uh, the NIV cultural background study Bible, I did study notes for the New Testament there, but sometimes I had to I had to say, okay, this should probably be translated this way, <laughs> because, um, you know, and so there's, there's good, just like there's going to be disagreements on other things, there's going to be disagreements on the translation. If, if you don't read Greek and Hebrew, it's good to have something that's fairly word to word, or word for word, closer to that direction to keep the the translators honest, um, because they know, well, they should, they actually don't always know, but they should know the idioms in Greek and Hebrew, figures of speech that we don't necessarily pick up on if it's like a word-for-word -word translation. At the same time, they may, probably unconsciously, but they, they're going to read it in light of their theology. And so you don't want their theology in your Bible, unless it happens to be correct. So that's why it's good if you're really going to study it in detail. Now, I know not everybody can do this all the time. So engage the Bible as much as possible, whatever ways you can. But, but for study, it is helpful to use like a couple different translations from it. So good. So Maybe good. A couple different approaches. Yeah. Dr. Keener, do you have time for one more question? I, sure. As I said, I want to respect your time. Um, Awesome. Well, let's land here then, and then if there's anything else you can you can share as you wish. Um, if you could distill then a few must know and must have tools aside from the scriptures, commentaries. Of course, like I said, I'm going to put all of yours uh, in the show notes. Must have tools for the effective study of scripture. What would they be? What can we um, bolster our study with? Yeah. If you don't know Greek and Hebrew which most people don't. But if you don't know Greek and Hebrew, good translations uh, is, is first. And then second, I would say, access to the background, uh, which is easiest to get through background commentaries, uh, hopefully well done ones. <laughs> and then, um, and, and also, uh, not as a tool, so to speak, but just as a primer just to learn, well, the method. But you learn that especially by doing it, by, by studying Scripture, working through Scripture. So I've met people who know Scripture really well. They've never been to seminary, but they just immerse themselves in Scripture, and, and they're sensitive in how they read it. You know, they may not know the background, but they realize, okay, this might be addressing a situation there, and, you know, they're eager to learn. I know people who graduated from seminary, not not usually my current seminary, but I, I've known people who graduated from seminary where I've heard them preach, and I'm like, was I their professor? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm embarrassed. Uh, uh. They're still quoting John 10.10 10 out of context. So we, we want... Um, uh, I do have a free 
Bible interpretation manual, kind of like that, on my website, uh, craigkeener.com. So it's free. It's in the free resources section. It's available in a couple different languages, uh, Spanish and and some other uh, some other languages. But but really, it's just saying in more detail a lot of what we've just said here. Right, it goes into more detail in the different literary genres, so you can get more of that. But, but I'm not saying you need to read that to, to really understand the Bible. The biggest thing, is is the fear of the Lord and context and doing the best you can with the the background and taking into account the different kinds of writing. You after after you read it enough, you'll get the feel for okay. Hebrew poetry uses a lot of figurative language. It's it's got parallelism in it and you know you get used to reading certain kinds of texts differently than you read other kinds of texts just because you realize okay these are these are different you you try to pay attention to the text is i guess you'll you'll figure a lot of that out hmm. wow folks i told you this would be riveting dr keener i'm so thankful before i let you go um, is there anything else you want to leave with the listeners today? I am just immensely thankful for the deposit you made in all of us today. You're kind. You're very kind. I was converted from <clears throat> atheism in 1975, hmm. and the little kids in Sunday school knew more about the Bible than I did, because they, they at least knew Bible stories. I didn't know anything, <laughs> except I heard of the Trinity and gargoyles. You know, <laughs> uh, So... Yeah, half of what I knew was was wrong, but um, but God just gave me a craving to understand His Word, and I found out if you read forty chapters of the Bible a day, you can get through the New Testament once a week or through the Bible once a month, and that was pretty hard though. <laughs> I mean, I was working forty hours a week. I remember. And, just having to spend most of my, you know, on my lunch break, I'm there reading, reading my Bible. You can't, I know there's other things people have to do, but, um, but I, I guess I just want to say to love God's word and, and nourish your heart with God's word. Immerse yourself in God's word. There's some parts of it that'll come easier to than others. It's okay to start with those. You know, if you can't if you can't digest uh, liver, go ahead and start with with uh, lettuce or something. You know, <laughs> whatever. Uh, or, or if you have to, start with the ice cream. But you know, uh, just develop that that love, that hunger for 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 scripture, for hearing God's voice. There, there's not like one. You can spend a lot of time. Uh, studying it in detail, you can survey it. Like when I was doing 40 chapters a day, I, w I was reading it quickly. I wasn't um, spending an hour on each paragraph or something like that. Both ways are okay for different stages in, in the learning. You know, one, one gives you a grasp of the big picture. One gives you a grasp of details. So th the big thing is just desire to learn and dig in and learn everything you can. And then by God's grace, by the power of his spirit working working in you and in your study of the Bible, embrace it and live it out. Embrace it and live it out. You've given us a gift today, Dr. Keener. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me.